Welcome to the Bosch and Roll channel. If you want to support my daily eternal magic offerings while getting amazing perks like the Discord community, have me play your deck on the channel, or my list and cyborg guides before tournaments, check out Patreon or the YouTube membership program. This channel is made possible by these amazing sponsors. Check out all their links in the video description below. Once again, thanks for being here. Let's go play some magic. Welcome back to the Bosch and Roll channel. Today, I've got something a little different than my normal offerings. Once in a while, when I have something worth reporting, I'll do one of these video tournament reports. And this past weekend, I attended the Punt City 2 CEDH tournament run by sponsor of this channel, Eminence Gaming. And I won. I got first place. I believe that's worth reporting on. So let's talk about it. As is the normal structure for these things, I'm just going to go through my Twitter thread from the weekend and do my best to remember what happened. Here's the trophy shot with the one of one winner playmat. Love it. Here's the deck picture. I'm about to go over to Moxfield so we can get a better look at the actual contents and construction of the deck. We'll start there. But here's the, the physical cards that I played with. Okay, let's talk about the deck first. The deck is Timna Krom, aka Blue Farm. People always ask if they're not familiar with CEDH what blue farm means and the answer is i don't know basically nothing it's just one of these silly names anyone who's played magic long enough knows that decks get silly names like dead guy l or full english breakfast or whatever the heck blue farm is one of those this is tim necrom it's a combo control underworld breach ad nauseum deck it's the same archetype that i won okotoberfest with back in november but i've made some changes to the deck We'll get to those in a second, but I'm going to talk to the non-CEDH folks for a minute first. Just explain what this deck is and what it does. Timna and Krom, basically the point of these being your companion, your companion, your commander, is that each one has the word draw a card on it, and they represent a good spread of colors. You get to play every color that isn't green, and Timna is whenever you deal combat damage to a player, you I'll just read the card. I tried to paraphrase it and just botched it immediately. Okay. 2-2 two, two lifelink. At the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you may pay X life, where X is the number of opponents that were dealt combat damage this turn. If you do, draw X cards. So Timna incentivizes you to have enough creatures that you can hit multiple opponents in a combat. In 1v1, Timna can't draw more than one card in a turn, unless you have more than one combat phase per turn, and more than one post-combat main phase per turn. But... In Commander, you have three opponents, so if you hit two of them, with a, each with one creature, Timna can draw two. If you hit everybody, you get to draw three. Krom, 4-4 four, four, Flying Haste for five. Whenever an opponent casts their second spell in a turn, draw a card. This is just a big, chunky body. It's one of the biggest creatures you'll see in CEDH. CEDH does work like other Eternal formats, where a lot of the creatures are some sort of little value engine or some sort of lock piece, and there's not a lot of just big honking bodies in the format, and 4-4 four, four flying is among the largest. Air Elemental Beatdown is part of this deck's plan, and it's a giant evasive body that can trigger Timna. So these two work well together of just keeping your hand full as the game goes on. The creatures in the deck, I have more than normal, and we're going to talk about that when we get into the deck specifics, but generally what I tried to do here, and what builders of this archetype in general try to do is have value creatures that disrupt your opponent while having evasion. So they impact the board just by being there, and then they also make it easier to draw cards with Timna because they're hard to block. Dothy Voidwalker has Shadow. Professional Facebreaker has Menace. Ragavan, you can dash out when nobody expects it. Sarah Ascendant has Flying most of the time. Loyal Apprentice creates a steady stream of flying creatures. That's sort of half of the creature base. The other half is the disruption. We've got Containment Priest, Dothy Voidwalker, you don't get graveyards, Granith Magistrate, nobody else gets commanders, nobody else can Underworld Breach, Esper Sentinel drawing cards, Grand Abolisher is a silence, Lavinia is a pseudo silence, but also a pseudo lock piece. Lavinia is really great early, kind of medium late. Just one of these cards. Ranger Captain is another silence. 
opposition agent obviously if you play any eternal format you've seen this one can't search deck well you can but i get it big deal just a lot of the most efficient obnoxious creatures in magic and then thassa's oracle as the win con simeon's spirit guide as a mana source so in this tournament i cast simeon's spirit guide as a 2-2 as many times as i exiled it for mana it was a pretty reasonable body when the game gets grinding and you don't need another mana timna cares about you having creatures let's go there are the sorceries in the deck uh tutors and wheels basically dam is one of my flex slots we'll talk about that when we get into the specifics but demonic tutor diabolic intent gamble savine's reclamation is just more underworld breaches right of flame because we're kind of a storm deck mnemonic betrayal is a win condition wheel of fortune to reset instance these are all interaction and ad nauseum basically demonic consultation and tainted pack win with thassa's oracle ad nauseum draws most of your deck brain freeze goes off with breach we don't need to go card by card here you can see what's going on and then all the most efficient counter magic there is uh, force of will force of negation flush storm dispel etc fast mana very important to this format and we've just got all the best of it here enchantments this is what this deck is really about there are only four enchantments but i would argue that two of them are two of the most important cards in the deck underworld breach is your win condition most of the time you can get there with combat you can thassa's oracle consult or thassa's oracle tainted pact but most lines end up at underworld breach and then ristic study is your other thing Basically, if you're set up to win the game, you tutor for Breach. And if you're not set up to win the game, you tutor for Ristic Study. And those are the play patterns of this deck. Mr. Grimora is kind of a mini Ristic Study. Your opponent has to pay more to stop you from drawing cards, but Grimora will die eventually if you stop paying for it. Dress down just utility. And then we got some lands to cast our spells. And that's the deck. That's the basic primer for the specific... CEDH folks who want to talk about exactly my list in detail. This is the Moxfield compare feature, comparing my first place deck from Oktoberfest back in November to this deck that I played this weekend. And I changed seven cards, which is kind of a lot if you think about every card as being 1% of the deck, because it is, you get exactly 100 cards. And changing seven cards is a pretty big switch because the point of blue farm is that it's just a pile of incredible cards across four colors just you get all the best non-green cards and what do you want to do with them just like any other eternal format the bar for what is a conventionally playable card is pretty high and what is more efficient than like the five most efficient versions of any effect like once they start to become pretty bad and then it's it's like you need a good reason to play it. So a seven card change in a blue soup deck like this is pretty big. And I want to point out the fundamental change that I made. It's everything that I cut has something in common. And what all of these seven cards that I cut, or I guess Pyroblast is the odd one out. That's just a value spell. What six of the seven cards that I cut have in common is that they are exchanging long-term stability for a short-term burst of activity. Bergy, I actually love Bergy, uh, but something had to be cut for my flex slots. 3-3, three, three, when you cast a spell, add red, and then the backside, uh, the Horn of Harnfell, you can discard a card to exile your top two cards of your deck, and you can play them this turn. So she's a ritual on the front. She's in kind of pseudo ad nauseum on the back but cast a spell to get mana now doesn't draw cards it only helps you keep velocity when you have velocity and the horn on the back side discard a card that's gone forever and you get two cards right now use it or lose it those are both high velocity kind of things or committing to a high velocity situation city of traders obviously the poster child for I'll pay you now, or I'll pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Just get two mana. If you ever play another land, this is gone. And Blue Farm 
the kind of the point of playing a deck like this over something like Rograx Silas that is a much better combo deck is that you can be more modal than them. Your commanders have real text on them versus just kind of being there for the colors and Rograx for the free spells. Kind of a joke uh, is like, oh, I've cast Silas. This game isn't going well in the Rograx Silas decks. If I cast Timno and or Krom, things are going great. I am really here for a long time. I want the game to drag. I want to draw cards off my commanders, off my Rhystic Studies. And just having City of Traders at almost any point is bad, except the actual combo turn, where you're just completely set up but exactly one mana short. The, the, the spots where this is a card you want in your deck are pretty slim. Imperial Seal is just the worst of the tutors. It's card negative. You have to spend a card to put a card on top of your deck and then you get to draw it later. So it's not like Demonic Tutor that immediately replaces itself. You actually lose a card when you cast Imperial Seal, and it being a sorcery. Like, Vamp Tutor is great, because you could do it in the end step, immediately draw the card. Imperial Seal, you have to either set it up with an additional draw spell on the same turn to get that card right away, which actually isn't that bad with Timna, but you do need a second moving part, and being sorcery speed, pretty awkward. Pactum Negation is a card that I never, ever felt like I wanted to cast. Because our deck, if a combo gets stuffed, we can just settle back into the Rhystic Study Timna game and draw more cards and try again. But the idea of throwing Pact of Negation on the stack to try to get your combo through right now, it's just a really aggressive play pattern that I don't like with this deck. So I cut that. And then Windfall and Time Twister got cut as well. The trick with draw sevens is the play pattern that you want to get into is dump your hand and then quickly draw seven so you get to leverage all your cheap things and your opponent doesn't. And Blue Farm just doesn't have all that many cheap things, at least not in the same kind of way that a really dedicated Storm Turbo kind of deck would. Like we don't have Springleaf Drum or Mox Amber or stuff that really just hits the board and hangs out there. I still have Wheel of Fortune in the deck because having one draw seven is worth it if you need a tutor for that, but having three just felt so bad. And Time Twister is actively rough because we're a breach deck. When we cast Time Twister, it's also graveyard hate because your graveyard goes into the deck too. At Okotoberfest, I had multiple situations where I had Time Twister in hand and I could cast it and I could protect it and I just didn't want to. And that's a card that needs to leave the deck. And like I said, Pyroblast just had to go for space, but that might be back in the near future. And then the cards I replaced these seven turbo spells with are five creatures, a more stable land, and a removal spell slash sweeper. These are six combo pieces and one hyper efficient piece of removal out for five creatures a land and a wrath of god that should fundamentally tell you where i am with building this deck i want to put creatures into play i want to attack with them all of the things that i talked about in the main deck tech about evasive creatures that do a little extra voidwalker's shadow loyal apprentice gibbs flying creatures Facebreaker has Menace and makes treasures. Sarah Sen, just the biggest body on the planet. And it's a one drop and it has flying. Four of these five creatures offer great Timna attackers while potentially disrupting opponents. Hallowed Fountain, you are a four color deck. This land doesn't die when it goes away and sometimes you just want a second Tundra. Containment Priest and Dam were the last two changes I made to the deck. I made these like... Wednesday night before the event. I left town Friday morning, so this was like one day before I left. The last things I did, I was pretty sure I wanted Dam because the two situations that Blue Farm for Gwilly finds itself in is I would win if I could just clear this Dranith Magistrate or this Dothy Voidwalker or this Ether Sworn Canonist. Just, there's just one stupid creature in play. Uh, Archon of Amiri is another one. There's just one stupid creature in place stopping you from breach killing everybody. And damn is black, black, destroy that creature. And then the overload of Wrath of God. The other situation you can find yourself in is Winota had a great start. Najila had a great start. Any of the non-Grixis decks 
are probably going to have some number of creatures in play. Mana Dorks, Birds of Paradise, Land War Elves. All those are cards in the format. Najila and Winota are top decks in the format. Sometimes you just need a Wrath of God. And the ability of Dam to do both is just so perfect. This card was incredible for the, the whole tournament. Every time I drew it, I was happy. I even considered tutoring for it once or twice. This, this just does both the things that you might need to do. I'm likely to have this in the list for a long time. My other flex slot is Containment Priest. And this one, I have no data for. Uh, I played a whole tournament with it. I played nine games. There were seven rounds of Swiss, plus the top 16 and top four. I think I only drew it once, and I didn't cast it. Because I was already comboing off. It, it was like, it, it just never showed up in the whole tournament. But the theory behind it is that every non-Grixis deck does some amount of cheating creatures into play. Like Winota triggering does this. Kinnon activation does this. Some of the other, like the Teamer decks and the Jun decks, they have Court of Calling, Neoform, Eldritch Evolution, etc. And I think as Blue Farm with our White Splash... We're already kind of favored against Grixis decks, like the other Grixis pseudo mirrors, and shutting down green shenanigans, and specifically Winota, is just where I want to be. As you can see, both of these flex slots, I take Winota very seriously. It's a deck that I think everybody should respect, and if they just respect it with a couple of cards in their hundred, we're gonna stop seeing that deck win tournaments. And I did play against it twice in the event. Dam was incredible in one of them. Fire Covenant, which is my other Wrath, was incredible in the other. I'm very happy with the decision to play Dam. No data on Containment Priest, but I did play against a lot of the decks. It would have been good if I drew it, so remains to be seen. But I could see myself cutting the Containment Priest and getting back a Pyroblast or a Blue Elemental Blast, just one other efficient piece of interaction. Things that people ask me about a lot, Lavinia is a frequent question. Lavinia, I just think she's like a pseudo grand abolisher in the mid game because opponents can't force, they can't pack, they can't misstep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they can't swat, they can't fierce guardianship, they can't deadly rollick. All of those cards are just turned off, which does turn off a lot of the interaction in the format, which is the purpose of grand abolisher. But if you're able to get an early Lavinia, she'll also turn off mana rocks, like any Chrome Mox, Mox Diamond, etc. stuff just can't happen. People can't Dark Ritual into Ad Nauseam. They could cast the Dark Ritual with one land, but then they can't cast the Ad Nauseam at all because they don't have five lands. It's just a really incredible card early and a role player in the mid to late game. I've won many games by just sliding a Lavinia in. Like I resolve an ad nauseum and then i start my chain with lavinia and that that just turns off so many things that i don't need to worry about anymore i love silence effects i think silence effects are better than counter spells in general in cedh and lavinia is a pseudo pseudo silence effect and i'm gonna keep playing her even though there are spots where she doesn't seem to be doing anything but she also is one of those cards that has an invisible effect on the game because your opponent can't play spells when she's in play, so it's hard to tell if she's actually shutting anything down or if your opponent just has different cards in their hand. But I've been very happy with her. Another thing about Lavinia is that she's a human. And very important to my list, Cavern of Souls is a card that I believe in pretty firmly. Human is usually going to be the name with it. It's one of your 20... Eight lands in your mana base. It's not a big commitment, but it's a huge piece of technology. The wisdom behind that is on these crazy long games where every, everybody has a Mystic Remora or a Rhystic Study or whatever, and everyone has seven perfect cards in their hand or 10 or 12 or 21 cards in their hand. Cavern of Souls on human, Grand Abolisher shuts it all down, and you could just combo out through any number of cards. The only thing that can help anyone there is if they have Ottawara Soaring City and can bounce your Grand Abolisher and then start interacting. The Cavern of Souls tech originally, at least to my knowledge, uh, proposed by Matt Sperling. I adopted it and I've just been so impressed with it that I've actually built around it further. Because if you look at the comparison again, 
one, two, three, four of the five creatures I added from my Okotoberfest list are humans. And one of the creatures that I cut was a non-human. Among the 17 creatures in the deck, including the companions, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven humans. Eleven of my 17 creatures are humans. That is by design, and I'm into it. Some thoughts that I had that didn't quite get there. I don't think we want more four drops in the deck, but Notion Thief and Grand Abolisher Augustine 4 are also humans, and they're also they do the kind of thing that I want, which is disrupt my opponent. I do own them. They're always in the considering pile. I just don't think this deck wants more four drops right now. I've also played Avon Mind Sensor in the containment priest slot. It's not a human, but it is an evasive, disruptive creature. If it checks all the boxes that I want. It does have flying. It does have flash. Just uh, another mini opposition agent, kind of. But for this tournament, I did specifically want to target Winota and Kinnon, which Avon Mind Sensor does not do. So that's why that is what it is. I mentioned Fire Covenant in passing. This is a card that not every blue farm deck plays, but I absolutely love it. Just the ability to control exactly what you need to control on a board is great. You could kill everyone's creatures but your own, especially in my build with 17 creatures in it. Something like Toxic Deluge will frequently set me back as far as it sets back everyone else. From being the biggest cat on the block and Sarah Ascendant being huge, there's like two creatures that could reasonably survive a controlled Toxic Deluge. But everything else is X2, X3, X1. It's going to be gone. So I like the that it's an instant. I like that I can pick exactly what's going on. You'll frequently see me pay 15 to 25 life into this thing. Don't worry about it. You don't need your life total to win. We do have Ad Nauseam, but we're really a Breach deck. Ad Nauseam is a distraction. It's a backup plan. Breach is what we're really doing here, and you can do that from one life. So Fire Covenant away. Just be aware with Fire Covenant that Deflecting Swat is a commonly played card in the format. You may choose new targets for target spell or ability. Fire Covenant... This can get real wonky if it gets swatted, but there is some silver lining. Like if you pay 15 life into this, your opponent can't just swat 15 damage however they choose around the board. They have to choose the same number of targets and they have to have the same values that you chose. So if there's a one, a two twos and a four and you paid nine life, they have to redistribute one damage two two damages and one four damage and they have to still target four creatures there's a lot of boards where just the creatures that need to die are very obvious and swatting your fire covenant doesn't really change too much one of my games against winota i cast a fire covenant and i killed every creature that wasn't mine but a Najula player swatted the covenant and i ended up losing my timna and they saved their Najila. And I lost my Krom, and they saved Winota, but they still killed all of Winota's other creatures, so Winota couldn't trigger in combat. And the third or the fourth player in the game had some stack pieces in play, like Archon of Emeria, and that died too. So losing my commander sucks, but we didn't die to Winota, which was the point all along. So it wasn't that bad. It's just a thing to be aware of. I've also heard some talk that people are maybe on Cyclonic Rift. I think that's crazy. You're going to have seven mana. I overload this thing on the regular. It works very much the same way Dam does, where sometimes you just need to remove one thing for two mana, and sometimes you need to re remove everything. It's less efficient than Dam, but it's one-sided, so it's a totally different calculation. Especially at the stacks games, where somebody has a bunch of sphere effects in play or whatever, nobody's really functioning, and all you're doing is hitting your land drops, playing out a mana rock here and there, you'll get to seven, and then as soon as you overload Rift, you win. Play this thing. Okay, now I think I'm done talking about the list. That was what I played and the specific reasons behind the things that I put in in my various flex slots. Let's go work through this Twitter thread and try to recall the matches. The Command Tower software by Eminence Gaming is perfect for hosting Commander events. It features easy to create event registration for four player Swiss structured tournaments. 
Event management has never been so simple, and it's web-based, so there's no downloads required. You can get access for just $5 at eminence.events. subscribe Here's my initial tweet on the day of the event. Just very excited to do this. Genuinely looked forward to this for... I mean, it's been on my calendar for months, but about two weeks out, I was really like, oh yeah, th it's almost time. I'm very excited about this. Then the week before, the Mox Masters tournament run by Playing With Power was streamed for the whole weekend. I just settled in and watched that. I was just so hyped for this. Favorite tournaments really are the best. I make a living playing Magic on the internet, but also I just really love to sit down with paper cards. Cool thing about EDH tournaments is you can just tweet your commanders because you have to reveal them at the start of the game anyway. There's no lost information as long as your actual deck list is a secret. Whenever I'm tweeting about 60 card formats, I just can't even say what deck I'm on because that gives away some information for anyone who might follow me on Twitter or know someone who does. But you can just tweet your commanders, your rules. It's free information. And reminding everybody, as always, always on my grind, my Patreon had this list the Wednesday night before the event. I post all my lists for any tournament I'm playing before the tournament on the Patreon and in the Patreon Discord if you want that sort of thing. Those links are in the video description. My hype song for the day, one of my favorite songs by one of my favorite bands, Appetite for Distinction by E-Town Concrete. The tone and co lyrical content of this song are basically, who do you kids think you are? I've been doing this forever. <laughs> and uh, it's true. That's how I feel about that. Pod number one. It was Animar in first position. In in this whole thread, the turn order is the order I listed the, the commanders so Animar, Cormella, me on Tim Necrom, and Narset and Lighten Mentor. The Narset player from fourth position jammed a turn one little to fairy, three mana to fairy, which is one of these cards in Commander that is powerful but dangerous. It's like defense grid, because it affects the whole table. Teferi makes it so. Only you, the controller of Teferi, can do anything at any time other than when you could cast a sorcery. Which means that if any other player presents a win, nobody else can help protect. Like You are just saying, I'm going to solo this table, I'm going to survive, I will stuff all of you, and then I will combo off without you interacting with me. It's a bold statement to make, and Narsa just turned one that thing, and it kind of tricked me. I don't know if it was just round one sloppiness or what, but for some reason, I thought I could still cast a counter spell on my turn. I obviously I know that's not true. I've played Teferi a million times on this channel. I know that that's not how the card works, but my hand had a protected or it had an underworld breach combo win with this spell. And my brain said, there's no way the Teferi player has two counter spells left. Dispel the first one. Nobody else can interact because of Teferi. Let's go. I put my Breach on the stack. They force and willed it. I dispelled. The table said, you can't do that. I said, yeah, duh. My bad. I put Breach in the graveyard and then passed the turn. And Teferi then played or set up the commander for the next turn with a Hall of the Bandit Lord, which gives the creature cast with it haste. So Narset was going to be attacking the next turn. Turn cycle goes around. I cast Savine's Reclamation to present the same Breach win that I presented on turn two. And the Narset player also has another counterspell. So uh, it was a two card hand and came up with another counterspell from that. So I kind of went off my own plan here, which my plan is to grind. I want to play a long game. My deck is not built to jam. I got excited by Teferi, thinking like, oh, half the people who could play this game can't play this game right now. It's just 1v1 versus a Teferi player, and I can present a win twice, and they need two counter spells in their hand. When I could have just like played some creature, attacked Teferi, and then settled into the plan I actually wanted to play, which is make the game go longer, and be able to interact with spells and stuff. So... It's tricky because presenting two wins in CEDH is generally desirable. 
but also being thrown off your plan by somebody else's random piece that you could clear if you wanted to. Maybe I took the bait there and should have done something different. But the result of the pod, as is frequently the case, the Narset player made the first big move. Narset attacked. I think you took three or four consecutive turns, just kept hitting time walk effects off of the Narset. Then he eventually whiffed, and we were all still alive, and then Animar won, because nobody could interact through the Teferi. So that's how that went. Round two was Yasharn, the big pig, Bruce Thrasios, a different Timnacron Blue Farm, and then me, also, of course, on Timnacron Blue Farm. Yasharn had turn one Sphere of Resistance. It was Land Soul Ring Sphere of Resistance. And I had the Force of Will, but I also could make land drops and play through this thing. So I let it resolve, and it slowed down the other two players. And then Yasharn played Defense of the Heart, which is a sick one. If you're not familiar with that one, it's a three and a green enchantment. That at the beginning of your upkeep, if any opponent controls three creatures, three or more creatures, you get to search your deck for two creatures and put them directly into play. It's very exciting. And the table all agreed to play responsibly about that. Nobody ever played a third creature, which is actually devastating for Bruce Thrasios. They're, they're a Mana Dork deck. They're a Gaia's Cradle deck. They're, they just do... They want a lot of creatures in play, but we were also pretty sure we would die if Defense of the Heart popped. Tim Necrom can play a little smaller, but we also like creatures, so it was holding us back, but we were all being responsible about it. And the thing I described in the deck deck happened, where I just made my land drops, played out a mana rock here or there as I drew one. I was poking with Timna, drawing cards in between, and eventually I overloaded a Cyclonic Rift and... Presented a breach win that was multi protected. But the other Timnacron player had a card that I don't play, and I know people do, but I don't like it. It's not a card that's in consideration for my list. It was Angel's Grace. They Angel's Graced me kind of mid combo. I think it was in response to a silence or something. It was like now or never. So they didn't catch me completely with an empty deck on Thassa's Oracle. That's why I like silences more than I like counter spells, because you just you just know that no nonsense is gonna happen. So I got Angels Graced in response to a silence, but I still had Underworld Breach in play, and I just yog willed it. I just uh played a bunch of stuff out of my graveyard, drew a bunch of cards, empty board, I had insane value, and I ended up winning the next lap around the turn cycle. And this I wanna point out an important distinction in the format. The stack stacks, the usually white base decks that are just trying to slow the game down. If they can't actually win the game themselves, that's good for blue farm. A deck like Winota that puts one or two stacks pieces into play then just freaking kills you, that's a problem. But a deck like Yasharn that doesn't actually have any sort of viable win condition, all they do is slow down and hope that that's enough, you will beat this deck eventually. You just got to hit your land drops, develop your lands, draw extra cards here and there, and turn 7, turn 10, turn 20, who cares? You're a better late-game deck than anybody else is, and just send those permanents back in and win the game when you're ready. Round 3, I was in first seat versus another Timnacrom Blue Farm, Orion, who is a Rakdos Vampire, and Elminster, a card I've never seen in my life, which is a... Azorius Planeswalker. The Florian player I played against twice at Oktoberfest, once in the Swiss and once in Top 16. And I knew his deck. I knew it's blazing fast, but highly susceptible to basically any type of interaction, like a Dranath Magistrate, a Archon of Emeria, a Deafening Silence. Any of these cards just turn that deck off until they're answered. Florian started with some fast mana and a goblin welder, and that immediately put Bolas' Citadel on my radar. My hand had Swords to Plowshares and Flusterstorm in it, so I could fluster an Entomb effect or a Tutor effect that would get the Bolas' Citadel into the graveyard, or I could plow the goblin so they can't flip the Entombed thing into play. The other Timnacrom player resolved a Dranath Magistrate in between, like that was their turn too. 
so I didn't have to worry about Bolas to Citadel for a turn cycle anyway. And then the Florian player, at the end of the next turn cycle, the Florian player hard cast Deadly Rollick on the Dranith Magistrate, which I could have Fluster Stormed and kept Dranith in play, which keeps Florian from functioning, but I didn't have my commanders in play, and the other Blue Farm player had played Timna. So they had Dranith Magistrate Timna attacked with Dranith drew a card. There are engines online and mine's not. I figured with Flusterstorm and Swords of Plowshares, I could fight this Citadel one way or another. And I let the Dranith go. And then Florian untapped and cast Bolas at a Citadel directly from their hand, where it cannot be flustered and Swords of Plowshares doesn't matter. And then they just went off and we all died. It was actually pretty tight. Uh, he, at exactly enough life, found Vampiric Tutor on the top of the deck. Trying to think of the exact number and reverse engineer the math here. I guess it would have been 10 life. A1, go to 9 to cast the Vampiric Tutor off of Bolas' of Citadel. Go to 7 to put a card of your choice on top. He went with Aetherflux Reservoir, which is a very exciting card when you are storming off using your life total. Went to 3 life to cast the Reservoir from the top of the deck. And this was our window. Any land he has to pass, any 3-drop he can't cast, he cast Final Fortune was the card under the Reservoir. At just full random, Final Fortune, gained a bunch of life because he had cast a bunch of spells that turn, and then untapped with a refreshed Bolas of Citadel, a refreshed land drop. Basically, can't miss from there and just went nuts on us. And this is one of those games where... I had a decision where I could have done something that stopped Florian from functioning, but the thing that was stopping Florian from functioning also stopped me from really functioning. Like, if I had a Ristic Study in play or access to one, if I had gotten my Timna in before the Dranith, I would have easily protected the Dranith and kept Florian out of the game. But I know what Blue Farm does when it has an engine online and nobody else does, because that's what I'm trying to do too. So I I could have done something different, it, at which point we would not have lost to Florian that turn, but we may have lost to somebody else two turns later. And this is one of those moments that you have to really reflect on as a player, where it's like, there's two schools of thought, which is, one of them is that if a play is 51% to be correct, then that's the correct play, even if you land in the 49% and you lose because you made the play or didn't make the play. But, you know, mathematically, it's correct. Therefore, do it more often, and over a career, you will win more than you lose in that spot. Then there's the other one, which is the correct play is the one that wins the game, no matter what the percentage is, which is how John Finkel thinks about Magic, where he's just like, it was the right play, it won the game. which. Yeah, we could argue about which side of that is more correct, but uh, I, I do tend to lean on the 51% line and the Bolas of Citadel showing up from hand after leading on Goblin Welder. The percentage of that is very small, and I had it covered any other way, so uh, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, but there was a thing I could do, and it's worth thinking about whether you should have done it First of all, acknowledge that you could have done it. And second of all, think about if you should have, even if it did lose you the game that you didn't. Round four. I played against Josh from Elder Drunken Highlander. He's a friend of the channel. Uh, really awesome person. Go check out his content if you care about casual commander or just cool magic deck building at all. All of his decks are crazy. They are things like Mono Green High Tide, Mono Green Control, Jeskai Elf Ball, mono blue aristocrats it, he just takes established archetypes and puts them in a part of the color pie they shouldn't be in and all of his decks are incredible uh, that's his whole channel go check it out minsk was in second seat actual jeskai creature minsk not minsk and boo the planeswalker jeska ishai this was gold saber tooth he is an artist and he's awesome go check out him too uh, he did the playmat and the token pack for hunt city he does a lot for the community. Just really cool art. 
It reminds me of the show Super Jail, if anyone saw that. It was one of those 15-minute runtime cartoons at, that aired at like 1 a.m. on Adult Swim in the mid-2000s. Pretty specific audience, but it's that kind of like, kind of weird, kind of gross, but also really compelling art. Uh, I like his stuff a lot. And then me, in fourth seat. Notice that I'm in fourth seat. I played nine rounds. I think I was in fourth seat for five of them, and I was in third seat for another one. I spent a lot of time at the bottom end of the turn order in this tournament. This pod was pretty scary. Uh, Josh from first position with Brawl and Shabraz had a genuine get vintage CEDH start. I think he passed turn one with like five mana in play and maybe some kind of draw engine as well. I don't remember the details, but whatever I kept looked really embarrassing by comparison. Mince, oh, I remember what happened now. Josh Brawlin Shabraz dumped his hand. Minsk dumped multiple mana rocks and something else. Then Jeskai Isha. Jeska Ishai. Yeah, there we go. It's tricky that Ishai and Jeska sound like Jeskai together, which is another magic word. I'm just going to call it Ishai. Then Ishai went mana rock, mana rock, land, time twister. So all three other players got to dump out their mana rocks and then get a fresh seven. And me in fourth position just had to take a mulligan that I have to keep. I've done nothing yet. I've made no decisions this game. I didn't get to play out any of my rocks or anything. And just here's seven cards and know you can't mulligan them. Start the game at random. And that's a tough place to be. So I was kind of playing from behind. My hand was kind of functional, but it didn't do what all the rest of the table did. Over the course of the game, Ishai played Narset, Parter of Veils, multiple times, and then myself and Josh took turns bouncing it because that's all we could do about it, and we're both card draw decks. Josh had a smothering tithe at some point. Uh, Josh presented the first win that was stopped, and this pod was the only one that went to time for me on the whole weekend, and I'm not mad at anybody here. I like all of these people. That said, when you're in a tournament environment, especially EDH, where games can tend to drag if certain things happen or don't happen, it's like very easy. They're, they're 90 minute rounds, by the way, 90 minutes to play one game. There is no final turn when time ends. Whoever's turn it is, finish your turn, that's it. There's not another round around the table. That's how Eminence runs their events anyway. At uh, Okotober, that was Monarch, who's a different TO. Uh, there was one more turn after time. I kind of liked it just ending immediately, because 90 minutes should be plenty of time to finish a game. But still, all that said, we were... The last member of our pod was just kind of sitting down when the round time started. The judge was like, welcome to round four, you can begin. Like, as the player was sitting down and introducing himself... And then there was a lot of like pregame chatter, like complimenting Josh's cool alters on his commanders. Like, I don't know if you can see it at this angle, but there we go, a little bigger. He's got like foil mountains and stuff, and they're textless and they look pretty cool. But there was like some conversation about that and talking about like art and how to do things and just general pleasantries like while the clock was running and nobody had presented a deck or cut the deck or drawn a hand yet and then there was some tanking there there's like healthy tanking and then there's like politely please we are on the clock here can you do something tanking and there was a little bit of both in this game and at the end i was super stressed out because my hand had silence a gamble that if I win my gamble, I can cast Breach. Like, it, five card hand, as long as I don't discard Breach, I can present a win. And I had Wishclaw Talisman, where that could tutor up a second attempt at a win. So I had Silence and two shots at a win if I get another turn. And with about 25 minutes on the clock, Josh started a turn where he did a lot of things. With about 15 minutes on the clock, the Minsk player started a turn. Then Ishai started a turn with like nine minutes on the clock. 
And I was like vibrating in my chair. I was like bouncing up and down, like, oh my God, please, please. And like anytime someone said anything, I was like, please, it's not about the game. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And we did go to my turn with like one minute left on the clock. And I presented my wins. They all got stopped by the table. But if I didn't have a chance to present those wins, I would have been inconsolable. Still didn't win the pod, but just a public service announcement to everyone. Please, the round clock is not your friend. It's your enemy. Do everything you can to sit down and get your mulligans out of the way so you can start playing when the round starts. Anyway, this was a draw. <laughs> round five. This was the last round of day one. It was a seven round Swiss tournament, two days, five rounds on day one. Najila, Winoda, Tyam, and me. Najila is a five color deck, but they're not really a blue deck in the same way that Timnacrom is, not even in the same way that Rogsai really is. Uh, they have access to some counter spells, but they're mostly just trying to shove their combo. Winoda is a non blue stacks deck, Tyam is a non blue stacks deck. So it's up to me to be the voice of reason and counter any spells. I also have to get through two dedicated stack decks and Najila that is an aggressive attacking deck under all the stack pieces. Najila came out kind of quick with a mana dork on turn one and Najila on turn two. Winota played out some creatures. They didn't really accelerate. Oh, I remember what happened now. This was awful. Their, Winota's turn one was Urza Saga, Pitch Simeon Spirit Guide, Dash Ragavan. Which felt crazy to me, because it's turn one, you could just cast Ragavan, and then it's in play forever, and you'll probably get the same treasure and use it at the same speed next turn. I, mean, I don't know their hand, but blitzing a Ragavan, or dashing a Ragavan on turn one just felt so crazy, especially spending an actual card in Simeon Spirit Guide to do it. But they dashed Ragavan, they attacked me, and they flipped my Jeweled Lotus. Of all cards in my deck, the Winota player, who just spent two cards to make one attack, flipped my Jeweled Lotus. So they basically guaranteed a turn to Winota there. Tyam had a Archon of Emeria to slow things down, which was actually great for me because it kept Winota off my back a little bit. And I just made my land drops, played a Lotus Petal, and on turn four, I overloaded a dam, which I think killed nine or 12 creatures across the board. It was an insane dam. And the board was clear. I was able to stabilize. Najila died to combat damage. Tyam died to combat damage. And then it was me, heads up, versus Winota. And this was a game where I cast a main spirit guide just as a blocker. I needed to survive one more turn. I had Vampiric Tutor in my hand that could get Underworld Breach and present a win. I just needed to have more than two life when I go into my turn. My opponent had Winota, Imperial Recruiter, Blade Historian, which gives all attacking creatures double strike, and one non-creature. I forget what it was, but they attacked with everything except Imperial Recruiter. And they ended up flipping Rick's Steadfast Leader off of the Winota trigger, which buffed the team plus two plus two, gave it lifelink and vigilance. I blocked with everything I had to block with, and I ended that turn at four life, where if they had attacked with the Imperial Recruiter as well, it would have been a 3 3 double strike, and I wouldn't have had blocked and would be dead. So I end step Vampiric Tutor going to two life, and the last card in their hand is Aven Mind Sensor, of course. And in the top four cards of my deck was the Underworld Breach. So I got the card I wanted, just completely at random, and easily breach one on my turn. I had a Wheel of Fortune just in case that I've been sitting on for a while, but I didn't really want to refill Winota's hand, but breach into wheel, and off we went. And I was able to just win by the skin of my teeth because they didn't fully commit to an attack. I think they left that back because they were worried about like Timna connecting and drawing me another card, but I had to chump block with Timna anyway just to be alive. So it was just like a moment of limited magic combat skills not presenting themselves. 
don't give the combo deck even one more draw step if you can avoid it. Put all that damage in. Round six, this was the next morning. Woke up refreshed, knew, had some breakfast in me, had some fresh caffeine. I was feeling pretty bad by the end of day one, I'm not going to lie. I did not get a good food break for a while. Uh, it And it fit. I could tell, like, take care of yourselves at tournaments. I was drinking a lot of water, but I didn't bring any snacks with me that day. It was a huge mistake. Anyway, next morning, it's Rogsai in seat one, then me, then Thrasios, Armix, and Tibbet. Rogsai was Happy Fox Alana, who is just a top 16 machine, very powerful player, and she was in first seat. I kept a hand with Mindbreak Trap because I respect Rogsai, especially when it's in first seat. And this match was kind of frustrating, not in like a way that would turn me off to the format or anything, but this match was kind of the thing that 60 card players complain about when they try EDH, where basically there are three people. And you don't get to make decisions for all of them, basically, which is what we sign up for. And you can't be mad about it, but this one was a tough one. Rogsai presented a turn one pile of mana rocks windfall. And I had the mind break trap for that. So uh, they were down to like one or two cards in hand and passed. Uh, I just start developing. Thrasio starts developing. Tibbet starts developing. The next big thing that happens in the game is Rogsai Vampiric Tutors for Ristic Study. And I think has one card left in hand when the Ristic Study resolves. And I'm just like, hey, table, this is how Rogsai wins. They pretend they're not a threat. They say, I already got stopped. And then they dig out with a fish or a Ristic. And I played responsibly around the fish. I don't think I gave it a single card. The rest of the table, not as interested. Uh, Rockside drew a lot of cards. At some point, Tibbet resolved and was representing a win, so I used Mystical Tutor, paid for Ristic, to find Swords to Plowshares, which then I cast for one mana, paid the three ward for Tibbet, and paid the one for Ristic Study, so I'm seven mana and two cards into saving the table here. I'm like, okay, we're stable, let's play responsibly. And then the other two players just shoved a bunch of spells into Ristic Study, and... Alana easily won with like a quad protected wheel and then put ad nauseum on top of the wheel on the stack when once we fought over wheel and she drew some extra cards off Ristic, like an ad nauseum showed up and then she nosed on top of the wheel and then countered her own wheel from underneath the nause and then uh, e just easily won. And uh, I think if we had just either slowed down our shit or been more responsible with the Ristic, the Rogs I would have been a not been a player in that game. Again, you never really know what's in other people's hands. Like, maybe they need all of their mana, or maybe they have a plan, or maybe they're actually more worried about me than they are about Rogsai, but uh, that felt like a tough game for table politicking. It just didn't work. And there are times that it's fine to feed the fish. Like if you think you're winning right now, or you think the play you're going to make is worth giving somebody two or three cards in the long term, Go for it. Just specifically Rogsai. This is a deck with every wheel it's allowed to play, every ad nauseum effect it's allowed to play, every tutor it's allowed to play. One card in Rogsai probably has higher card quality than one card in any other deck in the format. And th this was just one where talking the table into being responsible just was not successful. At this point, I wasn't sure if I could top 16 anymore. I knew that 17 points was a lock for top 16, and 16 points would be the tiebreaker situation, and there would be a lot of people on 16 points, but I have 11 points right now. A win gets me 16, and I'm in the breaker fight. I was 32nd going into the last round. Cut is to top 16. If you're 32nd in a 1v1 tournament, you are not making top 16. Just the number of intentional draws that are going to happen, and only half the people lose each round... You're just not jumping 16 spots. It's not going to happen. But in an EDH tournament, 75% of people lose every round instead of 50. And I like this is all pretty new to me. It's only my second CEDH tournament. 
So I wasn't sure if I even could jump 16 spots or maybe that's a perfectly normal thing that happens. I don't know. I just knew I had to win. My pod was insane. This is Cam from Play to Win. This is Ryan from Playing with Power. And Jorman is in the Mental Misplay crew. Uh, this is just all awesome people, high quality players, just legend pod. Absolutely. Part of me was like, oh, I got to do this for my winning in. And the other part of me was like, this is the only way I'd want to win it in. Uh, there's always two wolves inside you. I was in first seat, though. Cam was on Brazios Bruce. Ryan was on Rocco. And there, Jorman was on Tim Necrom, which was at least a little bit inspired by my list because he led on Cavern of Souls, Draneth Magistrate was his turn one. Jorman really just did the thing in this match. Uh, he went turn one, Cavern of Souls, Mana Crypt, Draneth Magistrate. Turn two, Timna, connect with Draneth Magistrate, draw a card. Turn three, Krom, connect with all three creatures, draw three cards. It was just really ripping. Like, this is exactly the blue farm nuts. That's what that looks like. And he, I think, kind of fell into the thing that I try not to do with this deck which is go before I'm a thousand percent sure I'm going to win. Which, if I'm being honest, reflecting about my approach to the deck and the play patterns, I do wonder if I could push a little harder sometimes and like, am I leaving value on the table by not chasing these like 75, 80% combo wins? I just... So it, it is the play pattern in a CDH pod that somebody tries to win they get stopped and the next player wins. That just happens so much that I never want to be the one who leaves the table spent on interaction, failing to win and letting someone else have the win. And all that interaction could have been for them. And all I have to do is just be more patient than the other player. And I just never want to be in that spot. But Jorman went for it. So there was a Ranger Captain of Eos in play for Rocco, which is an onboard combo stop. So Jorman started comboing with just a giant grip full of cards, went just far enough that Rocco had to pop the, the Ranger Captain. And in response to the Ranger Captain pop, pop, Jorman used Final Fortune, which is why Final Fortune is in the deck. Like if you get silenced on a combo turn, you can Final Fortune on top of the silence, let silence resolve, untap, go again. And it's, it's an all-in-play, like you lose at the end of a Final Fortune turn. But uh, Jorman did set all that up. And on his next turn, he had Silence in his upkeep that Cam was able to force. I had a Mystic Remora at this point, so I didn't have interaction at the time. But as everybody fights over stuff, I'm drawing a bunch of cards. So Cam had a Force of Will for the Silence, and then... That at least left me live to draw into interaction at any point in the turn, which, for the record, I never did. I had, like, 21 cards in my hand at the end of this turn, none of which were free interaction. I had both SWAT and Fierce Guardianship, but because Jorman had Draneth Magistrate on turn two, I didn't have a commander. Never had a Force, Misstep, Mind Breach, Trap, none of that. So I was just tapped out, drawing blanks. But Cam forced the silence. Jorman showed us the... Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation. Thassa's Oracle resolved. Demonic Consultation on the stack. Priority goes to me. I pass because I have nothing. Cam says, all I have is Besaju and Swift Reconfiguration. And he starts to cast his Swift Reconfiguration on his Devoted Druid, uh, probably just for fun. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't cast that. Just pass priority. And he was like, really? Uh, okay, I guess. And Ryan on Rocco was immediately like, oh, yeah, pass priority. So we all pass priority. Demonic Consultation resolves. Dorman ex exiles his whole deck. And then in response to the Thassa's Oracle trigger, I have Cam cast his Swift Reconfiguration, which triggers Krom because Cam started the turn by forcing Silence, and that's his second spell. Krom draws a card and kills Jorman with his Thassa's Oracle trigger on the stack. It's really important to remember as a 
Brixis or four color breach oracle player Chrom and esper sentinel are not optional rhystic study and mystic remora are so if you are about to go for an oracle win you need to either silence your opponents so they can't make you draw cards from your normally beneficial cards or you need to get those out of play the deck plays diabolic intent and calling the weak as both powerful effects for what they do but they're also there to clear your cards that could kill you once your combo's running. So, Jorman actually did cast the Diabolic Intent during his combo chain, but he sacked his Dranith, not his Krom. So there was... The win was there. He also showed after the game that he could have Cyclonic rifted... There was some stacks piece in play. I'm kind of blanking what it is. Maybe I had a Dranith as well. Like, he could have Cyclonic rifted my Dranith and gone for a Breach line instead of an Oracle line. That would have been a little more stable. Like he had other options, but just forgot about the Chrome thing and died. And then obviously because the whole table just spent all their interaction on Jorman and I was drawing with Mr. Grimoire the whole time, I untapped with like 20 cards in hand and easily won. Which is the thing that I just said about somebody tries to win and if they don't, the next player does. And I'm just never going to be the person who goes for an unsuccessful win and feeds the game to someone else. That put me on 16 points, 3-3-1, three, three, the perfect even Steven down the, down the middle. And I was going to end up somewhere. I said I ballparked 14th, but 16 points actually went from 13th. So there was one more slot than I thought there was going to be, which is good because I got exactly 16th. Good stuff. Never worried. No, I was super worried. My breakers were awful. I was sure I was going to be 18th and just... I was ready to drive home. I was like already packing up my stuff, thinking about what sub I was going to get from Wawa and ended up being exactly 16th. One thought of constructive criticism for Eminence is they read the standings from the bottom up. Like uh, when Zane came out to announce the top 16 and who had made the cut. The drama is in the bottom of the bracket, not the top. Like we know who's in first, but he was like, the top 16 is Brian Koval, Michael Mapson, like from the bottom up. No, no sweat, no drama, which, I mean, I, made me not sweat for a while, but uh, announcing first place last, it's a little more fun if you do it the other way. But either way, no matter how it was announced, I was in 16th. And that brings us to the top 16, which in a commander four-player game situation is two rounds of elimination. You come here to level up at Magic. To level up as a software engineer, check out the new YouTube series Dev Better, hosted by the founder of 7 Factor Software and Magic player, Jeremy Duvall. 7 Factor's small teams of high-performing engineers build custom mobile apps, APIs, and highly scalable systems for Fortune 500 companies and ambitious startups with great ideas. If you'd like to hire 7 Factor, or maybe join their team, contact them through their website at 7factor.io. And don't forget to subscribe to 7 Factor's YouTube for every episode of Dev Better. My top 16 pod was Najila, Tivit, Razios Tavesh, and me in fourth position. The seat order for the elimination rounds was determined by seating, which uh, I was 16th. So I was going to be in fourth for every pod, no matter how many I played. I was the last person locked in fourth for the whole thing. But as we saw, I was in fourth for most of this tournament anyway, so I'm used to it. And one of the cool things about Blue Farm is that you're not that turbo of a deck you are built to be resilient being in fourth versus first it's a disadvantage but it's not devastating in the same way that it might affect other decks i'll open this one up because there's more than one picture najila tivit razios tavesh and me najila came out blazing i think they had like mana dork into najila i think it was noble hierarch so najila had an extra point of power on the attack uh tivit had a bunch of fast mana and a Mystic Remora. And then Razios also had a turn one Mystic Remora. And then I had turn one Sarah Ascendant. So I have 6-6 six, six lifelink. Najila has turn two Najila. There's a fish and a fish. But I kept a two lander that wasn't really going anywhere else quick. I was just hoping to be stable by the time it got around to me. 
but the double fish kind of messed up my plans of lotus petaling, dark ritualing, dropping mana rocks, that kind of thing. So I decided to just be responsible and play my 6-6. Six, six. Najila and Tivit just had really great turn twos as well. And Thrasios, this moment was really interesting because Tivit paid for their Mystic Remora. Thrasios got to their turn, and I could see they were kind of hemming and hawing. They had drawn zero cards off their Mystic Remora. Uh, everybody was just responsible. Tivit and Najila had already dumped out their mana rocks. There was just nothing left to feed it. I was playing, I played a creature on my turn. Najila played Najila on their turn. And Tivit, I think, played Esper Sentinel on their turn. So zero cards drawn. And I could see they were kind of waffling about if they want to keep their fish around or not. And I showed them the Dranith Magistrate in my hand and said, you should probably not pay for that and cast your commander. Because Thrasios blocks Najila warriors, and it's a engine for later. And if they just pay for fish, I'm worried about this wide-open person just letting Najila get free cracks. I didn't want that to be a thing. So I showed them that I'm about to lock out their commander and that they would be incentivized to drop it. So they did not pay for their fish. Made their land drop, played Thrasios. I went to my turn, made my land drop, played Dranith. My Dranith in play locks Tivit out, and Tivit is a deck where its combo is its commander. So as long as Dranith is in play, we don't have to worry about Tivit stuff. They're still an Oracle consult deck, so they have that going on too, but at least the main engine was off. And I was bashing with my 6 6 lifelink on Najila because they are an ad nauseum deck. The game dragged for like a long time after this, but the important thing is Tivit kept paying for their fish because they had all this mana they were planning to cast Tivit with, but I had a Dranith. Najila also dropped a Dranith at some point, so they needed to kill both of them for Tivit to ever get online. That fish stayed in play for like six turns. Thrasios started missing land drops, and so did I. We were both on two lands for a very long time. And this table was the most responsible table that I've played in the entire tournament. We All of us paid for every Esper Sentinel, Ristic Study, and Fish Trigger we could. If we didn't have anything high impact to do, we just didn't cast a spell and feed the fish. And... At some point, the Thrasios player fired off a Tainted Pact and stopped at Fierce Guardianship. Rather than trying to chase a win for themselves, they just got another piece of interaction to make the game last longer. All of those things feed my game plan, because that's the game plan I'm trying to play on. And my only piece of interaction for this entire 5-6 turn setup thing was one Red Blast. So if anyone could have protected their Oracle from the Red Blast, then I would have been out of interaction. I'm not sure what Najila or Tivit had, but uh, these two decks, Tivit and Thrasios, are both Oracle Consult decks. They both had at least half their combo. At one point, the Tivit player Vampiric tutored and... They kind of bled a little bit, I'm not going to lie. I saw the card that they got with Vampiric Tutor. We were sitting directly across from each other, and they kind of, like, put the card down like this, like, oop. And I saw that they had Vamp Tutored for Thassa's Oracle. And without revealing that they bled, I just said to the table, because there's two Draneths, that player's probably going for Oracle here, so we should respect Oracle combo just to put it on everyone's radar. So... We were, I was worried about Oracle combo from Tivit. I was worried about Oracle combo from Thrasios. But then Thrasios used Tainted Pack just to find a Fierce Guardianship. And I was like, this is going to be a beautiful partnership. I had a really cool turn order. Not really politicking, but just using the turn order to my advantage moment. Najila presented a win where they had Najila in play already and put Derevi on the stack. And Derevi plus Najila with enough warriors gives you infinite combat steps and you can just kill everyone. And with Derevi on the stack, the Tivit player said, if somebody can feed me a card, I can answer this. And they showed Mystical Tutor. 
and they had the Mystic Remora in play. So if they Mystical Tutor, anybody else can cast any spell and then they get to draw their piece of interaction. And my hand at the time with my two mana was Enlightened Tutor and Red Blast. And I could have just Red Blasted the Derevi, but because Tivit had to act first, they made this offer of, I could tutor up an answer if someone can feed me. And I said, yes, I can feed you. Cast your Mystical Tutor. I wanted to see the commitment. Like, I didn't want to... I didn't want to have them pass priority, let me cast my spell, and then in response to their fish trigger, they tutor, because I didn't want to get got, and they get, like, consult instead, and answer it another way, and then win. So I was like, you commit your Mystical Tutor, and then I will feed you the card. And they Mystical Tutored for Force of Will, put that on top, and then it went over to me. I cast the Enlightened Tutor that I was going to cast this turn anyway, because I needed Soul Ring just to get mana and start playing this game. And my mi Enlightened Tutor that I was going to cast and was going to feed them a card anyway gave them the Force of Will, so they spent Mystical Tutor, Force of Will, and the blue card to answer to Revy that I also would have just Pyroblasted if they passed. So that worked out beautifully. I ended up answering to Revy, getting Mystical Tutor and Force of Will out of the way from Tivit, and still keeping my Pyroblast while resolving the spell that I wanted to resolve that turn anyway. And that, that was just like a really nice way that that lined up. And then as this game dragged out, this really interesting thing happened where I knew Tivit had Thassa's Oracle in hand, and I had told the table that it was likely they had Thassa's Oracle in hand. And myself with my Sarah Ascendant and Nijilo with the random scrappy pieces that he had had been beating up on Tivit. And Tivit was at like seven life, dead on board to the next round of combat from me and Nijila. And asked a painted pact on their upkeep. I think they were like in response to Fish going to seven, they tainted packed it in their upkeep. And I was like, oh, here it is. They're just gonna like go down to two or one cards in their deck, like whatever their devotion minimum would be. And then Oracle us here. I still have the Pyroblast, but that's the only interaction. We're gonna need some help. And Tivit flipped past time sieve. So the Tivit combo was gone. They flipped past the Mana Consultation, so that was gone. And then they stopped on Dam. They had assessed that because they were dying to combat, they didn't think that their combo was going to work anyway. So they'd rather just clear the board because maybe someone would help fight over that. And then they could figure it out later which was awesome for me because I had already considered in this game Mystical Tutoring for Dam on this turn cycle to try to clean up Najila. And then Tivit not only gave up their chance at an Oracle win, but also exiled their other card that facilitates an Oracle win, and they exiled their Time Sieve. So they exiled all of their reasonable win conditions to find a card that I wanted to be cast anyway. And it was amazing. So Dam resolved, it killed Najila's whole board, it killed Grazios's whole board. Uh, they had some mana dorks up at this point. They had that Simic creature that basically does the same thing as Training Ground, Biomancer something or other. They had Thrasios in play. Like their engine was online, it all died. Najila died, everything that they had built up. They had some mana dorks too. I lost my Dranith and my Sarah Ascendant, but the board was clear. Uh, Tivit also lost his Esper Sentinel along the way. And a clear board in the mid game is exactly what I want in life. And I was able to, I think I tutored for Aristic Study and put that into play. And then on the next turn cycle, my Aristic had drawn me into a Mystic Remora. So I added Mystic Remora to the Aristic Study. And then by the next turn cycle, I had like 25 cards in my hand and won easily. So I don't know, actually, if Tivit could have just won with Oracle. I don't know what interaction Thrasios and Najila had, but I just had the one Pyroblast. And they had a lot of cards in hand from their fish that had been in play for the whole game. But they must not have been confident about it, and 
they went for the sweeper, which actually fed me. But they were done on board, so they had to do something. And I don't know, this was just like a really responsible pod. Paying for all the fishes. Tainted packed for Dam from Tivit. Tainted packed for Fierce Guardianship from Thrasios. It, just nobody was trying to win except Najila. Everybody was trying to play control. And I'm just the best control deck out of all these decks. So it ended up feeding me extremely well. And we were on to the top four. The last of the four top 16 pods was taking a really long time. They were in just like a really grindy game with a lot of politics. I was watching them for a while and just enjoying. There was like hands in the air and like hands in heads and swear words. And they were really arguing with each other about how the game should go and where every spell should go. And it was just, it was all in good fun. Nobody was having a bad time about it, but it was just really beautiful. CEDH. I can't do anything, so I'm going to try to get you to do what I want kind of stuff. And Mike Sad, Sad Robot Alters, also one of the Playing With Power crew, he won the previous Punt City tournament. So he was the returning champion. And he is a person who I've shouted out before as being really clever and subtle with their politicking. Like, there are other people who just yell, like, why would you do that? This is clearly the threat, blah, blah, blah. Mike is just sort of like, oh my god, Dockside Extortionist would be so good here while someone's resolving a tutor, but there's a Null Rod in play where Dockside Extortion doesn't do anything. Like, he just sort of drops these subtle hints and tries to get people on the hook in a way that's really, really just wiggly, and I like it. it it's not big theatrics, it's the opposite. It's understated, it's underacting. And I walked by this game, and I was like, it was basically a Razakats deck that was miles ahead and a Niv-Mizzet deck that was slightly behind, but I think pulling ahead of Razakats. And then the Rakdos Florian player, who was completely locked out of the game, and Mike on Winota, who basically had very little going on. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to have to play against Rakdos or Winota in the finals. And then I walked away for a little bit, came back, and when I came back, the table was just scrambling to answer Mike's Winota board somehow through the seven cards in hand, multiple pieces of interaction. The Razaketh player had an active survival of the fittest uh, and a Grand Abolisher in play. Somehow that player had not won and nobody had interacted with Mike to the point where he had an overwhelming Winota board. And then at some point in the game, Mike's board killed the Razakats player, who seemed to be miles ahead with protected win lines. Last time I looked, he was just out of the game. And then a really fun thing happened. The niv player bounced Mike's deafening silence with Cyclonic Rift, tried to go for a win, got stopped, and passed the turn to Mike. But the Rakdos player final fortuned at the end of niv turn so they got the next turn before Deafening Silence could be replayed. And this is where the, the Mike said, understated, let things fall game plan kicked in. Mike had a Dranath Magistrate in play. Lorian, the text on that card is, look at the top X cards of your deck, and you may exile one and play it this turn. Dranath Magistrate doesn't let you cast cards from exile. So Florian was just a 3-3 first strike with no additional text. The Rakdos player also had opposition agent and tried to cast scheming symmetry, which you and another person search your deck for a card and put it on top. Like you both get a vampiric tutor, but with opposition agent, you get a vampiric tutor and you steal your opponent's card and that goes into exile where again, it can't be cast because of Dranith Magistrate. Mike convinced, like gently convinced the Niv-Mizzet player, just said something like, this Florian's going to see a lot of cards. And Niv-Mizzet hydroblasted Florian, and then Niv-Mizzet also countered the Scheming Symmetry, both of which would have resulted in no castable cards. And it's a final fortune turn, so this player's about to die anyway. And then that player died. 
and then it went to Mike's turn back in the original turn order outside of the, the Final Fortune turn. And Mike got a set of Winota triggers. The very Winota that that Hydro Blast that was used on Florian could have killed. And that set of Winota triggers found Blade Historian for a lethal attack. And he just took the pod out from under two people who seemed to be duking it out in a 1v1 about who's going to pop off first. And Mike just made it happen. Shout out to Mike. While I respect that grind uh, and the way that he delivers it, I resolved to myself none of that was going to work in the final pod. Zero <laughs> percent. And the final pod was Sise, Dargo, and whatever this thing is. The card is in Japanese, and I've never seen it before in my life. It's a 3-7 menace that whenever a creature deals combat damage, you gain life equal to its toughness. I think it's mostly there for the colors, but this was a Jund Turbo Storm deck. Mike's Winota, and me in fourth seat with Tim Necrom, of course. I did something in this game that I don't normally do, I kept, which is keep a turbo hand. My hand was one land, which was Forbidden Orchard, which is the worst land in my deck. It does tap for all five colors, but giving any of these car any of these decks a 1-1 spirit could hurt me. They all have ways to use them, like Winota, it would trigger Winota. That's off the table. The Jun deck definitely has uh calling the weak and could have Gaius Cradle. Probably doesn't, but it might like calling the weak sacrifice, uh, those sort of effects. Sisse is a guy's cradle deck, also a creature deck, so everybody benefits at least a little bit from having a 1-1 one -one spirit. But I had Forbidden Orchard, Simeon Spirit Guide, Jeweled Lotus, and Dockside Extortionist, and Mental Misstep. So, And then two other cards that don't matter. I figured the Mental Misstep would help us survive the Jund Storm deck, like, I could hit a Dark Ritual with it, or a Calling the Weak, or something like that, and at least buy a little time. Maybe I could hit a Soul Ring out of Winota and slow her down a little bit. Uh, I thought Misstep would line up well, and I figured all of these decks would have a bunch of Mana Rocks, and a turn one Dockside could get my Commanders into play or something, and then develop a game plan from there. What actually happened is nobody played a single Mana Rock, nobody played a sim single One Drop, Mike played... Jeweled Lotus, Turn 1 Winota, and Phyrexian Walker, the 0-3, zero, 0 mana 0-3, is just a non-human non to attack for Winota. And when it got to my turn, that Phyrexian Walker was the only artifact or enchantment on the board, so Dockside made less mana than it cost to cast. So I figured getting on board at all was better than not, so I used the Jeweled Lotus, the Simeon Spirit Guide, and my land to play Chrom. At least get him into play. If anyone starts moving, I get to start drawing cards. And at this point, I said to the table that I'm a zero Winota triggers kind of gamer. If I could do anything to stop Winota from triggering, I will. I will gamble for swords to plowshares. I don't care how detrimental or card negative or risky it is. I think it's more risky to give Winota even a single trigger. And I know there are folks who think differently, like... One trigger is not so bad. Maybe they'll whiff even. Or maybe they'll hit Magus of the Moon and we just don't play the game. How about that? Like, no. Uh, if we could stop this, we should. And the table agreed. And then proceeded to do nothing about Winota. And Mike did get a trigger out of it. But some artifacts and enchantments did come into play on this turn cycle. This, this whole league, or this whole game, is on the Eminence Twitch. The VOD is available if you want to watch this game in its entirety. But Mike got a Winota trigger, it made Professional Facebreaker, he got two treasures, and passed the turn. I'm able to Dockside now, because Mike has the two treasures and some other stuff. I think the Dockside was for four, and I had Fire Covenant in my hand. So I... Or the Dockside was for six, my bad. Because I spent two of them right away to play Wishclaw Talisman, and I had four left with Fire Covenant in my hand. Fire Covenant is going to clear this Winota. That's, that's my plan. To say also Dockside's on their turn, which gets all the same things I got, plus the four treasures and the Wishclaw. So it's, it's just a gigantic Dockside. I can't do anything with it. And then Dargo goes for a Culling Ritual, which I respond by 
killing all of the big creatures that are not going to die to culling ritual. And then I spend some extra life to kill both players' dockside extortionists just to stop some mana from coming out of the ritual. And then after Fire Covenant resolves, then I float blue off my last treasure. And then to say Dovin's Vetoes, the original calling ritual, just another good use of turn order there. Uh, got me to clear all my treasures, got me to do all the work against Winota, and then countered the spell uh, once he had enough information and he got to keep his one million treasures. But Winota was pretty stuffed at this point. On Winota's turn, they end up with an Othersworn Canonist and a Dranith Magistrate in play, which are uh, both good against the table and good against Sisse. Like the Othersworn Canonist shuts down this John Storm deck like a boss. The Sisse deck barely functions with Dranith in play, but I still have Krom. That doesn't die to Falling Ritual. I obviously didn't target it with anything else, so Krom is still in play. We get back to my turn, and my Krom has drawn Mana Crypt and Mana Vault by now. And I use Mana Crypt to cast Mana Vault. I activate Mana Vault. I use Mana Vault to activate my Wishclaw Talisman, which I still have because the Calling Ritual was countered. That gets Ristic Study. I still haven't made a land drop. I just give somebody a random spirit token and play Ristic Study. I'm like, okay, I got Krom, I got Ristic. This is my plan now. Sisse does nothing with their turn. I think they have hit a land drop. They're down to like one card in hand. Not a lot going on. And in Sisse's end step, Dargo plays Noxious Revival on the Culling Ritual to try that again. Untaps, draws, and casts Culling Ritual. I'm cool with this because I wanted it to resolve last turn. I have nothing that it kills. Or I have the Crypt and the Vault that it kills. And... I'm actually worried about those because my life total is pretty low from people beating up on me, and I might actually die to my artifact mana. So I'm not worried about that. Sisse uses their last card in hand to Swan Song, the Calling Ritual. I use that mental misstep that I've been sitting on the whole game to protect the Calling Ritual. Then a bunch of stuff dies. Dargo gets like 13, maybe 17 mana. It was a lot of mana. Uh, you can check the video for the exact amount. And they cast Peer into the Abyss, which reads, target player loses half their life and draws half their deck. I have a Krom trigger because it's their second spell of the turn. And in my hand is a Vampiric Tutor that I found somewhere along the way. I Vampiric Tutor in response to my Krom trigger. I put Deflecting Swat on top of my deck. I draw a swat from the Chrome trigger, then I swat the appearing of the abyss to me, and miraculously, nobody can fight it. I just draw 40 cards, go to 7 life, and Dargo tries to follow up with a Necropotence, which my 40 cards that I drew included Force of Will, I counter that. Mike has one turn to do anything, but my 40 cards also had Chain of Vapor in it, so I can bounce anything Mike puts into play before we get to my turn. And then on my turn, I just easily won with a million protection spells because I just drew 40 cards. And that was the tournament. This deck is great. And obviously, I'm bringing a lot of experience from other formats and just general magic experience. But, and I'm not saying you're a fool to do anything else. Like, there's a lot of viable ways to approach CEDH. But if you are a legacy or vintage player, to whom combo control decks like base Grixis combo control decks make any sense, this deck will feel really natural to you. You'll just have to learn what specifically CEDH you need to worry about and what the pressure points are in the format for the various decks. We talked about the list already, but Containment Priest is the flexiest of the flex slots. You might not need three sweepers. I think in a more defined metagame, I would cut Priest for probably Blue Elemental Blast. Just one more cheap way to interact with the format. Oh, there's a lot of good red cards that need to be countered, you know, like Winota or Breach or Krom, etc. Wheel of Fortune. I think that's a reasonable place to go. You could also play even Mind Sensor in that slot for more generic targeting, but I just left my house this weekend deciding that I'm not going to lose a game to Winota. And I didn't. I played against it twice, and I won both of those pods. And Dam was involved in one of them. Fire Covenant was involved in the other. 
and just my high density of sweepers paid out. And that was my experience at Punt City 2. I've now played in two major CEDH tournaments, and I've won them both, which is obviously wild. I mean, I play a deck that I believe to be the best one, and I play a lot of Magic. I've been playing Magic for a long time, so I'm probably one of the stronger players. But even with that, like, you need some luck to win a tournament. You need some things to break your way, like... I bubbled into top 16 on breakers. I could have easily been 17th or 18th. So just a little bit of luck here and there and control the things you can control. Hope the things you can't control go well. But obviously winning actual first place twice in a row is incredibly meaningful to me. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to the cookout, which is Eminence's next event. It's in Atlanta later this summer. Go to eminence.events. The link is in my video description. They're a channel sponsor. You can find them through any of my stuff. But that's the next event, and I'll be chasing that three-peat. And I will be on Blue Farm. You can't talk me off it. I might change two to seven cards again, but I'm going to be on Timnacrom. I'll just... I'm not afraid to call my shot. This is a deck that I believe is great and makes sense to me, and I'm going to keep doing it till it stops working. Tournament shout outs, of course, Eminence and the crew. The event ran smooth. The pairing was smooth. The 90 minute rounds with no additional turn was actually pretty smart. That's plenty of time to finish a game if everyone keeps each other honest with like, hey, let's let's make a play here. Shout out to my roommate and Eternal Glory podcast co-host Bryant Cook, who appeared at his first major CEDH event this weekend and made top 16 with his trusty Rograx Silas combo deck. Gold Sabretooth, who I got to play against and who drew this cool mat and drew all the cool tokens. Go check out his art and stuff. Jorman, who I got to meet in person. Uh, I played against him a long time ago. One of my first CEDH games ever, actually. Jorman was in the pod, and it was really cool to meet him and play against him in real life. Very fun person to be around. And shout out to Wawa, because although they are worse than cheats overall, they do have better subs, and you can get Coke Zero Lime, which is not a thing that exists anywhere else. Kudos to them for securing the deal with Coke where they get the, the soda robot. Sheets just has regular old fountain drinks. So, Wawa, thank you for filling in for my true love over the weekend. Shout out to everyone I played against too. Didn't play against any jerks. Didn't play against any salt lords. It was just a good weekend all around. Good people. And I'm looking forward to doing it again. I'm out of here for now. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Check out the deck list on Moxfield. Check out my Patreon if you want my deck list before the next thing. Always happy to share what I'm working on with the patrons. If you just want to like... Ask me in the Patreon Discord where I'm at with Blue Farm. Even if there's not an event coming up, I'll share. I'll tell you what I'm working on. That's all there. It's all in the video description. Thanks for being here, and I'll see you for the next video.